Welcome back to the NFSA live series screening of Marbo Life of an Island Man. And it's now time to welcome our special guest filmmaker, Dr. Trevor Graham. Um, I'll start the, the Q&A off, but we will also be answering your questions as we have a yarn. Uh, so please keep sending those through uh, using the live chat. So uh, welcome, Trevor. Thanks, Tash. Nice thanks. to be here. Oh, thanks so much for uh, being okay. part of this today. It's such okay. a privilege to have you uh, here with us. Um, I thought it'd be really great that um, if you could just start um, by telling us a little bit about yourself, your background in filmmaking. Sure. First of all, I'd like to welcome everybody um, and say what a great initiative this is. And um, I guess thanks to coronavirus, uh, we have these sort of new opportunities and new technologies that are helping us get to people in their homes, which I think is fantastic. So, yeah. So what would you like to know? Yeah. Um, well, I guess it'd be really great just to get a, a, a bit of a backstory to what um, got you into filmmaking. Okay, um, I've been making films for probably way too long, which is about 35 years. Um, and I guess I was principally motivated by the ability for documentary to tell compelling human stories about who we are as human beings and the way that we relate to or don't relate to each mm. other in a way. So I've been interested in the, in politics, I've been interested in history. Um, I've also made uh, a, quite a number of films with communities over the years, including Murray Island, the Marbo family, but also the Yolnu people up in northeast Arnhem Land. Um, and I've been particularly interested in uh, working with Indigenous communities because I think there are such amazingly rich stories mm. to be told by Indigenous people and with Indigenous people about their own history, society and culture. That's really important um, to engage um, Indigenous people in that way that, yes, that yeah. they're able to um, be part of that um, yeah. filmmaking process, yeah. um, definitely. Yeah. Um, so just in regards to um, Eddie Marbo mm -hmm. and um, his family, um, how did you first meet Eddie? Well, back in 19, early 1989, not very many people knew about the Marbo case. The Marbo case had been going for seven years as a preliminary kind of hearing in the High Court. And I just happened to have a friend in Melbourne, which is where I lived at the time, who came into my office one day and said, eh, have you heard about the Marbo case? No, what's that? And she was a, a law student at Melbourne University and she knew that I was interested in land rights and in Indigenous mm -hmm. culture. And she was too. And she said, well, it's, it could potentially be a game changer for the whole land rights movement. So we talked about it some more and I went and did a little bit of sort of uh, research in Melbourne in the legal fraternity, people that I knew, and I knew I happened to know someone who was also an advisor to Eddie Marbo and his legal team, but I didn't know it before this this interest came about. And um, so I went and had a chat to her, and she said, I'll just ring Eddie up and go and see him. So that's what I did. So Earlier was, I think it was January 1989, one very hot, humid evening. I went yeah. to visit um, Eddie at his home in Hibiscus Street in Townsville and uh, we had some drinks together and with him and his wife, Benetta. And the whole thing really started from there. It was, it was a process of us getting to know each other that evening. I think we talked till, you know, one or two in the morning and he then drove me back to my hotel and um, I went back to Sydney, oh, Melbourne at that stage. And, um, yeah, it just sort of took off from there. Really. And, you know, we, we had a lot of mutual interests mm -hmm. that we quickly established. And what really amazed me about Eddie Marbo is that he was so knowledgeable about so many things. Like, you know, he had a background in the union movement. Mm -hmm. So he was interested in union politics. He was interested in Labor Party politics. He, he flirted on the edges of the Communist Party in Townsville. So he had this sort of um, uh, 
a worldview, which is quite astounding, I thought, and I, that really sort of drew me to him. And later on, his his kids told me that he used to listen to the BBC World News and he was an avid sort of soaker up of listening to the radio and listening to news and reading newspapers. And then that extended to when he was um, working at James Cook University. He used to go to the library. He was a gardener oh, at, the, yeah. at the library at the university. Yeah. He used to go to the library for lunchtime and just soak up all this sort of knowledge. And so, you know, he's a pretty easy person to relate to if you're interested in a broad range of things to do with politics and society yeah. and culture. Yeah. Oh, that sounds so good, like um, giving that insight to him, I suppose, um, on a personal um, yeah. sort of way. Yeah. And, of course, he's also very much in his own Murray Island culture. Yeah. And also in Townsville, he was very deeply involved in many, many Indigenous organisations like um, uh, the legal, Aboriginal Le and Ireland, the legal service, the health service. He started the Black Community School. So he was really, you know, deeply involved in his community, mm -hmm. um, sometimes controversially, I think. Um, I think, you know, there's another side to Eddie Cookie Mabo, which is um, people saw, some people saw him, perceived him to be an arrogant kind of guy. Right. And I could kind of understand that. You know, he was very um, determined and he was very, you could say he was a bit full of himself. <laughs> but I think that was sort of a good thing in many ways because it just showed his level of determination to actually get things done. Mm. And in relationship to the Marbo case, he was always determined and a believer that it could succeed. I was just going to say, did, did you think um, in getting to know him like that he had any idea about, you know, the significance um, his land claim uh, would have in Australian history? Yes, yes. Yes, he was absolutely focused that this would be a game changer and that um, he would go down in the history books. And do you think that that was probably, um, I suppose, that drive, that determination was what really sort of, um, you know, I, built I, the case? Or was there I, other influences? I, I, don't want to, I don't want to turn him into someone who's sort of got this giant ego. <laughs> um, he certainly had an ego, and, and that was a motivation. But he was really driven by the sense of injustice about what had happened to him in relationship to owning his own land on Murray Island. And that was the primary thing. He was just shocked, mm. completely gobsmacked to find out that the island that he'd grown up on and that he'd taken for granted and that his family for generations had taken for granted was not his land. I mean, we're talking about a tiny speck mm. in the Torres Strait and to be told that that's not your land, that this belongs to this notion of the Australian crown, was just jaw-dropping for Eddie. But he also knew that if he could prove that he owned his land and his family owned their land, that that would apply to all Mar other Murray Islanders, but it would also have influence on the mainland as well for Aboriginal people mm. to be able to claim their land. So he was he had a big picture and he had a small picture and both were motivations. And I think that he really saw that uh, this could be the game changer for Indigenous people, but he also saw that it would be a game changer for non-Indigenous people because it, the whole notion of terra nullius was such a huge gobsmacking lie that Indigenous people weren't here. It was an empty land yeah. before Europeans arrived and that there was no sense of land ownership by Indigenous people. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just a huge lie, a huge historical disaster in my view um, that has shaped our country in a not very good way for 200 years, up until Eddie Mabo 
and his fellow plaintiffs in the High Court. And Eddie could see that that would be a game changer for non-Indigenous people as well, and I think that's true. Yeah. And I think we are a better society for the High Court having ruled in favour of Eddie and his fellow plaintiffs. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of truth-telling there. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, absolutely. Um, Still a long way to go. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> definitely. But we are we are moving in the right direction. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so also... We know uh, Eddie as the family man. Mm -hmm. Are you able to share with us um, your experience with um, Eddie's family? Sure, sure. Well, you you asked me before what were the most significant moments of working with Eddie, and I, I have to stress that I only probably met Eddie four or five times in the process of making the film, and very soon after I met him, he died. Mm. Like, I only actually knew Eddie Marbo for two years, um, from 1989 to 1991, which is when he died. Um, so my relationship with the Marbos has really been with Benetta Marbo, mm -hmm. Eddie's widow, and with his seven children and now many, many grandchildren. And it, it's through... The, the the family that I really became involved in making the the film that everyone has seen tonight. Um, when I first met Eddie, I made a film called Land Belong Islanders, which is about the Marbo case and the significance of the Marbo case. But it wasn't about Eddie Marbo's personal story and what his motivation was. So because I'd shot that earlier film and I had all that film footage. After Eddie died, um, Benetta Marbo asked me to come and film Eddie's tombstone opening yeah, wow. in Townsville. And then the grave was desecrated and trashed by right-wing Nazis. That's the only word you can describe. Yeah, Right-wing Nazis trashed his graves, painted swastikas on, and, on his headstone, and... That was just such the most profoundly sad thing that I had ever experienced in my working life as a filmmaker. And so together with the Marbo family, we said, well, let's use all this body of material that we've filmed by then over a period of six years to make another film about Eddie and what yeah, wow. his motivation was. So it was a very collaborative process in that respect of working very closely with the Marbo family and then working with the Murray Island community too to make yeah. the film. Must have been an amazing experience. Yeah, yeah, it was. It um, was. Just speaking of experience, um, we had a, a, a question from um, one of our viewers. Mm -hmm. um, they wanted to say what a great um, film it is, mm -hmm. but also they wanted to ask you... Um, if there was any sort of challenges or problems in, in uh, or I suppose, the process or making the film around around that time? Okay. Well, um, to make a film like this in Australia then and to a certain extent now, it's really helpful if you've got uh, a broadcaster involved. We were very lucky to get the ABC involved at an early stage. They, they loved the idea of... Uh, a film about the Marbo case and about Eddie Marbo and telling his personal story. But we always pitched it to them as a feature-length film, so a 90-minute film. Yeah. And it really needed, as I hope everyone who saw it tonight will agree, it really needed to be that longer film, longer, longer in time to really unravel a story and tell the story as it unfolded and really to get inside the character of Eddie Marbo. Um, but when it came around to showing it to the ABC, they wanted a 50-minute version, and that's all they would take. Yeah, right. And this is a, an ongoing problem with our public broadcasters today, mm -hmm. with SBS and the ABC, that they are fixated on the TV hour and very, very rarely will they commission something that's 90 minutes, a feature-length documentary, for instance. So... Look, we just fought the good fight. I had, fortunately, Film Australia and the power of Film Australia behind me at the time, and they said, well, if you don't take it, 
at 90 minutes, well, it's not going to look very good for the ABC, is it? Because it's about to go to the Sydney Film Festival and have its world premiere at the Sydney Film Festival. And I said, well, what am I going to say to the audience when they say, are we going to see it on TV? I'm going to say no, because the ABC wouldn't take mm. it at feature length. So anyway, this is still an ongoing issue about documentary and um, and broadcasters, unfortunately. It still hasn't been resolved. And Marbo was made in 1997, and they're still saying exactly the same sort of things. Yes. Yeah, we won't screen feature length documentaries. I never knew that. Yeah. There um, you go. So that was our big problem. But look, it got resolved. They took it. The film went on to be an enormous success, really. Yeah, so, so, totally. So, you know, the proof was in the pudding. Amazing. And um, I see it's actually airing actually next week on SBS. Right, as well. on, on NITV? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. That's so great. It's a favourite. Yeah. Um, um, can you just let us know a little bit more about the production process um, for this documentary and um, as you just co covered the challenges, what were, I suppose, some highlights that you really enjoyed? Being on Murray Island. Yeah, it's paradise. <laughs> I haven't been, but... Well, I, being I've on Murray Island beautiful. with Eddie Marbo was... I spent, um, I think, about six weeks on the island with Eddie and Eddie being our tour guide around the island and filming with him and his family and his friends and um, filming the gardening scenes that you see in the film, the fishing scenes that you see in the film. Um Eddie could be uh, a little bit challenging to work with in that um, he'd make arrangements to film at a certain time and then, of course, he wouldn't turn up and he'd find, where is he? Oh, he's off gardening somewhere. Or gardening, he's fishing. gone fishing. He's got out, he's out in a dinghy fishing somewhere. So it was a little bit sort of fraught at times, I have to say, with my white fella expectations of time and schedules and yeah. <laughs> kind of Not having to adapt time. to island life and island time. And do you think that there was any kind of, was there ever a feeling of any cultural barrier or? No, no. Not, not really. Um, we as a film crew fitted into island life pretty comfortably. Um, we'd each of us worked in other Indigenous communities, so we were sort of, um, I felt perfectly at home, to be honest. And... Um, we had Eddie as well to be, you know, chaperoning us around the island and we went and stayed at Lus, his family land on the eastern edge of the island, away from the main community, camped there for two or three days and that was very beautiful and isolated and yeah, very nice like and just sort of, you know, cooking, cooking on a campfire and sleeping out under the stars. So it's beautiful. Yeah. Is there anything else that you um, would like to share with us about um, the film that um, I suppose something from behind the scenes um, in the making? Well, the, the thing you... I didn't really answer, say what I wanted to say. The, the thing that I'm probably proudest of in relationship to the film is being adopted into the Marbo family. Mm. And that has meant an ongoing relationship with his, his family, now his kids, because Benita passed away yes. last year, sadly. Um, but, you know, there is this very strong bond that I feel with that family, my family, mm. and it's a very precious kind of thing. And it's it's kind of a little bit symbolic in many ways. We've had this rich, ex this rich shared experience of making the film, and I think that can be a bit symbolic for what Australia can be if we all embrace each other mm, as we I agree. should. Um, I just wanted to know, I guess, about um, the family and like what you were saying, it's up, you know, the kids now mm -hmm. um, and the legacy that I guess um, Aunty Benita and, and Eddie have yeah. um, left behind. Yeah. Um, what's your relationship with them now? You're still um, close? Is there... Any, I suppose, ideas around whether you may do some future documentaries or, ah. films or things like that? <laughs> well, Gail, and Marbo, Gail Marbo and I have been talking about making a film about the Black Community School in yeah. Townsville because that was one of Eddie and Benetta's initiatives to establish a black school for kids 
who probably otherwise might have been a bit shunned within the normal school system. Um, but amongst their own community, they could really flourish in a better kind of way. And Bet, um, Gail approached me last year to say, oh, it'd be great if we could make a film, collaborate on a film together to um, make a doco about the black community school and what it meant to Townsville mm. at that time. And mm. it was a good idea. And how, uh, just a bit of background about that, like when was that established? It was established in about 1974, 75, I think. I think it was during the Whitlam government era. And uh, it was... Yeah, wow. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Um, we might go, um, we have a little bit more time that we might go to some um, questions. Uh -huh. So just let me um, see if I can just get some for you. Sure. Um, I, th I suppose, like, um, it'd be really good also. Um, I feel that... Um, what we were talking about before in regards to the importance of um, Indigenous filmmaking and Indigenous mm -hmm. people, um, I suppose, representing their stories mm -hmm. um, and their way. Um, is there any advice that you have for any um, young up-and-coming Indigenous filmmakers that may want to become successful documentarians like yourself? Right. Well, the great thing is now... Oh, and I mean also, sorry not just Indigenous filmmakers, any any filmmakers, yeah, especially sure, who sure. have an interest to work with Indigenous. Sure. The, gr the great thing about the Australian doco scene and drama scene now is that there are actually quite a few Indigenous filmmakers, people like Warwick Thornton and uh, Rachel Perkins, just to name, you know, a, a yeah. couple um, who make very good work and, and are internationally acclaimed for yeah. their work. I mean, Warwick's films are... Sensational, completely sensational. Um, but, you know, I, I guess the advice I have is just keep at it, you know, be determined. Mm. If you've got an idea, then push it to the nth degree and when you get your knockbacks, well, keep on going. Keep on proving people wrong. That's the best thing you can do is to prove people wrong if you get a knockback. And also, you know, try and find some experienced filmmakers to help you. Yeah. You know, go knocking on people's doors and say, you know, I've got this idea. I need some help. Yeah. So find people. Yeah. Find That's... people who want to help you and find people who've got the experience and the runs on the board to give you that help. Yeah. That's great. Great advice. Um, so that comes to the end of mm -hmm. our um, our yarning session. Um, but... Thank you, Trevor. It's been such a pleasure. Pleasure, yeah, to, pleasure for me too. Um, you know, hear you share your story in the background to mm. um, your filmmaking, and especially also, um, you know, I really cherish your um, memories of Eddie mm -hmm. and um, his family. Mm -hmm. um, and I also wanted to thank our audience. Um, for joining in and um, participating um, with our live chat. And um, please go to our website for more Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, collection material um, from our NFSA collection. We hope you'll find it very useful in your own reconciliation journey. And remember, we're all in this together. <laughs> See you for our next NFSA live event. Thank you and good night. Yep, good night. We all have our own story, not one story, but we all have our own story.